So now continuing our discussion on the SAR clade, we'll entitle this next flowchart SAR clade 2 and wrap up with uh, the other types of stromenopiles that we weren't able to cover in the previous video. So we'll subtitle this again stromenopiles and let's remember those stromenopiles are characterized by their two flagella, one of which has that hairy characteristic and the other one which is much smoother and shorter. Um, and so that gives us our stromenopile subgroup of the SAR clade. Now within the stromenopiles, there are three subdivisions that we have to remember. And those three subdivisions are the diatoms and now the other two which we'll cover in this video. The first one to remember is the golden algae. Like I mentioned before, diatoms are a type of algae. It doesn't have it in their name, but nonetheless, still a type of algae. Most protist diversity is devoted to this idea of being algae, having that algae characteristic and thus found in oceans and freshwater, whatever it may be. For a golden algae, we have to understand that these individuals, these protists, are mostly unicellular. Again, I didn't say all unicellular because you can never say all for protists. Um, so mostly unicellular. And uh, the thing about them that is a bit characteristic, I would say, is that they're covered with tiny scales. Covered with these tiny scales, uh, which, uh, which, are, uh, which are microscope. And on these tiny scales, what we uh, see in terms of the molecular structure is silica. So that's a, a characteristic that we saw in diatoms as well, the silicon dioxide uh, of their cell walls, and also calcium carbonate, CaCO3, which stands for calcium carbonate, both of which are very, very broad and uh, important structures uh, in terms of having a structural strength to whatever the cell may be. Gives the cell uh, the strength to combat the harsh nature of, let's say, its environment. And in terms of its environment, we can actually classify the golden algae habitat to understand why it would need such a harsh uh, covering, such harsh uh, scales, let's say, on the outside is made of silica and ca calcium carbonate, these strong components. Um, its habitat is usually going to actually be both in the freshwater and marine habitat. So this is an example of both freshwater and ocean water habitat. Marine is another way to say oceans. Um, and these are actually... Uh, closely related to nanoplankton. Related to nanoplankton. So nanoplankton, which uh, a lot of people already know about plankton, are these uh, microscopic uh, organisms that live in water. Um, they live in a water column usually together and they swim with the current. Uh, golden algae are a ancient uh, uh, ancestor of these nanoplankton um, that most people are quite familiar with. And they're an ancestor because they are the protist version of them, let's say, and thus they are going to be uh, a bit older since protist means, of course, the very first. So that's our habitat that we have to uh, be aware of in terms of uh, the com combination of why they need this silica ca calcium carbonate uh, tough exterior on them at least. And then finally, uh, for the golden algae, uh, another thing to remember about them is that they are photosynthetic, like most other algae, like most alga, as the plural of algae would be. Um, photosynthetic would definitely refer to the fact that they actually have uh, a certain color to them. Uh, when we think of their golden algae's color, of course, the color is golden. But why is that? And that's simply due to the fact that they undergo this photosynthetic process. And this photosynthetic process is characterized by pigments, if we remember from Bio 1. We can't just forget all those information about photosynthesis. And pigments play a big role because in golden algae, there's actually not gold pigments per se, but lots of uh, yellow and brown uh, pigments on the golden algae photosynthetic structures um, and specifically these are actually referred to as carotenoids that's the term to remember carotenoids and if we remember from bio 1 carotenoids are just an accessory pigment and the majority of the accessory pigment ACC for accessory pigments are yellow and brown in their color and thus you get a golden overall color of this stromenopile which is part of the sarclade which is a type of protus which is a type of eukaryote. So golden algae are eukaryotes um, that are photosynthetic that have this characteristic color and characteristic structure and this habitat that we've mentioned already. Now that covers our golden algae. Um, the next one to cover is a very very broad class of stromenopiles um, known as the brown algae very, very big 
very, very diverse, very, very complex. And almost everybody already knows what brown algae are, but they just don't know that they're called brown algae per se. A uh, good thing to look at for this as I, we go over these facts uh, is figure 28.12 gives us a good idea of the brown algae. Uh, important thing to know about brown algae, they are actually the most complex protists. They are the most complex protists. And so they of course are going to have some sort of a complex structure and with complex structure comes complex function and that complex structure is exemplified by the fact that these protists are actually multicellular something you wouldn't expect from uh, the protist group of organisms we do have some multicellularity as I mentioned in our introduction uh, they are multicellular and because they're multicellular they actually form uh, the largest algae the largest algae that we know of. And a lot of people don't know this, but this actually simply refers to the fact that brown algae are another way, a fancier way, of at least saying seaweed. And most people know what seaweed is. They've seen seaweed. They understand what seaweed looks like. They think it's a plant, and that's a misconception, at least. This is a large, multicellular protist, the largest, at least, the most complex, at least, because of this multicellularity. A good example of the complexity that we see within brown algae is kelp. Kelp is uh, another direct example, better way of saying seaweed at least, and kelp is a good example of the complexity because kelp have very plant-like characteristics, not plant characteristics, plant-like characteristics. I'll um, go more over on that distinction uh, as we move forward, but stay with me for right now in terms of the kelp. Just remember that kelp have three main parts to them. They have a blade, they have a stipe, and they also have something called a hold fast. Now, these are all plant-like characteristics that the kelp has. The blade represents, I would say, the top of the plant. That would probably be the, the characteristic leaf of a plant. Put that in quotes, okay? This resembles a leaf of a plant. The stipe would be the thing right below the leaf usually, the thing that's holding the leaf together, holding it up, would be the stem of a plant. So that's our stem. And the holdfast is the, is the ground nature, is the, is the foundation of this kelp, and that would probably be the roots of the plant. But one thing to make very, very clear is that these structures are not related to the plant in terms of evolutionary history, in terms of phylogeny. These structures are analogous to plants. Be very comfortable with that distinction. They are analogous to plants, not homologous. Okay? Not homologous. What does that mean? Plants and kelp do not share a known common ancestor. They don't have a common ancestry, a common uh, evolutionary history. They are just similar, these leaf, stem, and root, blade, stipe, and hold flash structures in terms of functionality not in terms of evolutionary history. Keep that in mind. They are thus analogous. Classic analogous example is the fact that we have a bird wing, let's say, and an insect wing, both of which function in flying. Does that necessarily mean they came from the same common ancestor? No, absolutely not. Same idea with kelp. Kelp are a type of brown algae, and that brown algae um, has that complexity associated with it. Finally, last thing about the complexity, the complex nature of these brown algae is that they are photosynthetic. They contain chlorophyll, a good amount of chlorophyll, as most photosynthetic organisms do, but they also do contain carotenoids, carotenoids uh, which are accessory pigments, as we mentioned before. What do you think these accessory pigments probably look like in terms of color? Probably somewhat brown in their color. So that gives us a good understanding of the complexity of brown algae. Uh, we can actually also continue our understanding of brown algae. Let's uh, classify their habitat. Their habitat is usually going to be marine. They're usually found in oceans, um, usually around here actually, in cold northern waters. We usually, I can, uh, I've seen seaweed uh, living in the ocean before. Most people have seen kelp before um, in its natural habitat. 
so cold northern water waters um, and an interesting thing to note about their habitat is they actually because they're so plant like in their characteristic and in their function um, they actually create underwater forests which is pretty cool to me at least um, they create underwater forest habitats so much so that you know it's it, it's hard to think that these are protists these are very primordial organisms very very basic organisms but these are the most complex version of those basic organisms creating forest habitats for other organisms to live in so that puts into great perspective how we got all the way from like the simplest of things like diplomonads which need a host that are parasitic in nature because of their feeding groove that they use um, all the way to something that can provide for others like a brown algae so that really shows the spectrum of complexity between protists uh, um, and that gives us a great idea of what the brown algae are really capable of in terms of their complexity. <clears throat> and final thing about the brown algae, I'm getting a little too excited here, is the commercial importance of brown algae. Most of us actually know about this commercial importance, especially around this time of the year. Now, first of all, brown algae, some of them are edible. Some people eat kelp. Some people uh, believe it has good health benefits, and it does. So uh, there is some edible component of brown algae, but what's of commercial importance, I think at least uh, that's important to remember, is the algin. Algin is useful. Algin is a characteristic component, uh, a molecular component of all brown algae. It is a cell wall component specifically, so we'll write that down. Cell wall component of brown algae. So it's found within the cell wall, of course. Um, specifically, it's a polysaccharide within the cell wall. Um, great thing about algin is that if you are a protist living in water all around you, all over you, sometimes you don't want to get too much water within you. Okay, I know you need it for photosynthesis, but sometimes it's a little bit extra, the amount of water that you're always constantly surrounded by. So uh, what you do is you actually absorb some water. Okay, You have this capability of absorbing a certain level of water and then keeping that water within you and not drowning yourself, let's say. So it absorbs water, um, and because it absorbs water, algin specifically, this type of cell wall component, we can actually use it. We as humans use this, and it's used as a thickener. It is used as a thickener in many commercial products, specifically, and this is why I said this time of year, usually when we have dry skin, we use hand lotion, right? Hand lotion has this very thick, usually, and creamy texture. Um, thick and creamy texture because of algin. Fun fact, that's something you can take to the dinner table with you. You want to know why your lotion has that thick, creamy structure? Now you know it's because of the algin, which is a cell wall component found in brown algae. Brown algae are a type of stromenopile. Stromenopiles are part of the SAR supergroup, and SAR is a type of protus, and protists are a type of eukaryotes. And that gives us a good summary ending to this uh, final understanding of the stromenopiles within the SAR clade.